Now, in the states that have this, there are some exemptions to those taxes. And here they are, like gifts, uh, deeds to a charity, uh, if there was a partitioning back to the joint tenants, um, if it was from a parent corporation to uh, a cancellation of stock, those are all exempt from that tax. I have never heard anybody tell me that there's a question. So what we covered was the voluntary alienation of how a grantor would deed a property to a grantee through that deed process. There is a second way that property can be transferred, which is called involuntary alienation. This is doing it without the owner's consent, all right? And there are a couple different ways it can happen. Remember, we talked about eminent domain, where the government takes the property. Remember, they do it through condemnation. The right is eminent domain. Please understand there is a difference. This is the right. If you remember Pete and the governmental powers, the one E was eminent domain. The process by which they do it is condemn the property. Another way they would take it is through escheat. If a person dies and has no will, leaving that real property to anybody, and they have no findable heirs for the property to go to, the state will take that property from their estate through as cheap. That is when the government does it. There is a third type called foreclosure. Now, I have said several times that quiet enjoyment is the right to be left alone from a third party unjustly taking your property. And I told you at a time there are just ways. Here is one of them. Foreclosure is a just method of taking your property because you failed to make payments on real estate taxes, on your mortgage, on any special assessment, and now some entity, some creditor is going to foreclose and take your property from you. So what you have are three ways by operation of law. There is a fourth method that I'm sure you guys have all heard of, and you guys have probably called it squatter's rights. You probably heard of that term, right? Actually, the legal term is called adverse possession. And we talked a little bit about it on those easements where we called it a prescriptive easement, where a person was using another person's land to sneak out the back and it eventually became a, uh, a pertinent easement for the public. This is very similar or this is, however, this is actual transfer of ownership of the property. And there are certain things that have to happen, much like we talked about before. It has to be open, meaning someone sees that person living in the property. It has to be notorious meaning they know who it is. It has to be hostile, meaning without the true owner's permission. It has to be continuous and uninterrupted. And it has to be adverse to the true owner's right of possession, meaning they can't be living on the property with you, like a roommate couldn't try and do it because you're actually living in the property as well. So this would be like, let's say you own vacant land out in Montana to, and you want it for hunting and you fail to go and you did not notice that someone moved onto the land, built a little log cabin and is now living there. They, that might all fit these requirements. Now remember, continuous and uninterrupted and tacking still applies. So let's go back and review that just so you make sure you understand. Has to be continuous and uninterrupted. So let's just an example say it has to be nine years. That's an example, depending on what state you're in. Has to be continuous. So it has to be for all nine years. All right. The principle of tacking allows for multiple succession 
of ownerships to do the same thing. So let's say a person does it for three years and then sells that log cabin to somebody else for six years. That would be nine years because of the tacking principle that's applied right here. All right. But it also has to be uninterrupted, which is what we mentioned earlier, meaning this person does it for three years and they sell it to another person. And that person says, well, you know, I'm really not going to do that. I'm kind of a law abider. So they don't do it for two years and then they sell it. And when they sell it, they say, hey, you know, the last person's been doing this and they do it now for six years. They would have to actually start over because it was interrupted. So tacking still applies in this principle. Each jurisdiction has the requirements. I told you in that example, nine years was just one that we had, I picked out. It could be 11 years. Some states are as long as 21 years. Now, when a person dies, that is called a conveyance of a deceased person. Now, a deceased person is said to die testate. Testate is the legal word that means they have a will. All right. A person that dies without a will is said to have died in testate. Now, this is probably part of the reason English is such a hard language is because there's all kinds of stuff like this. So a person that dies testate means with a will. And if you remember, we talked about a testamentary trust is made after the person is dead and is created by their will. This is where it comes from. Because that person would have died testate, meaning they have a will. And in that will, they said, I want to create a trust fund. That trust fund would be a testamentary trust because it was made after they were dead. A person that dies intestate means without a will. This is a cheat. If a person dies intestate, meaning they have no will and no heirs, then the state would take their property through uh, as cheat. So a person that dies testate dies with a will. If they leave real property inside of that will, that real property is called a device. All right. So if they leave real property inside of the will, it is called a device. And this is what we're talking about. The transfer of real property inside of a will is a device right here. Actually, that's a little bit better. Let's do it that way. So that person that is the testator, right? That's the OR, testator, the one that creates the will, will leave a device inside of that property. When they die, since they are the ones that wrote it, they are called the device or, right? Because they are the ones leaving the property or leaving the device to guess who? The devisee. <laughs> and that stuff you put in your eyes is called devisine. Sorry, bad humor. <clears throat> and that transfer happens when the person dies and the reading of the will. There are many different state laws, so depending on what state can do that. You cannot write a will that supersedes state law. All right. So if you were to die and you have a girlfriend and a wife, which is probably why you died, you cannot leave property to your girlfriend because your wife, under the dowry and curtsy laws, 
or under the tenants by the entirety laws actually take precedence. So you cannot write a will that in essence cuts people out. Okay. Now a will is actually a legal document. So just like legal documents before it, that person that writes the will, the testator has to be of legal age and sufficient mind. This is what you hear questioned all the time. A lot of big court cases. I know it's getting kind of old now, but the Anna Nicole Smith court case where the old man left her all the money and then the old man's son from the first marriage claimed his father was not in his right mind and therefore that will shouldn't be valid where he left the money to someone else. He wanted the money, obviously, all right? The will must be, just like before, it's got to be free and voluntary act, can't be influenced, and usually it must be witnessed by two or more people. Those witnesses can't be a person that benefits from the will, dude. Nice try, <laughs> but think about that. You can't say, well, I heard my dad say that uh, as he passed away, that he left me everything. That is not going to count as a witness. Now, most states allow for a codicil. A codicil is the changing of the will or amending of the will. You can decide, hey, I want to go in and all of a sudden I've been in a bad mood. I'm going to get rid of a person that I was going to give all my money to and I'm going to change it to something else. That change can happen at will to a will. All right. Most states do not allow for what they call holographic will meaning handwritten, all right? They don't like holographic. They also don't like this term called non-cupative. A non-cupative will is one that is verbal. They want the attorney to go in and write it, not necessarily handwritten by the person or oral. Now, I'm not saying that they won't accept it and some states will accept those, but those are obviously easily argued by somebody that said, hey, that's not my father's writing or that's not what he meant. He meant to put this and not that. Or, you know, you didn't hear him right. So those holographic and non wills are easily contested. Now, if a person dies intestate, that's what we just talked about a minute ago. If they die intestate, means without a will, there is a certain order by which people will inherit property. It is called consanguinity. Not in the book. Don't worry about it. All right. So generally, there is an order. Spouse goes first. If you have children, then it's half to your spouse, half to your children. If you've gotten divorced and you have no spouse, but you still have children, then you can leave it all to your children. Now, here's the other funny thing about uh, family law. Family law is the worst law there is to practice as far as I'm concerned. Because, check this out. Do you know that you are not required to leave property to your children if they are of adult age they you could actually write that person out of your will now if they're underage like under the age of 18 you still have legal obligations to take care of that child so you can't write a minor out but let's say you have an adult son that you don't get along with you can actually write him out of the property but if you're legally married you cannot write that spouse out of your will so get this, check this out. This is what I'm saying. My son actually has my blood running through his veins and I can cheat him, i.e. not giving him anything. But my spouse, who I picked out of a lineup, think about that. I'll marry you. You can't cheat that person if you're legally married. 
So someone that is a blood relative, you could. Someone you picked out of a lineup and married, you cannot. Now, there's some other things that help determine what order as and the court will have to go through this is it deals with what's called the closeness of relationship. You know, it could be that maybe one of the kids is a lot, takes care of you, does all your stuff, and the other lives far away. I don't know. When a will happens, it must go through a probate. Probate is the legal validation of a will. All right. So let's think about this for a second. Here's literally what happens in, when a will happens. All right. A person would gather up all of their bills. They would sell all of their toys and use that proceeds to pay all of their bills off. And whatever money is left is distributed to the will or to the heir. Heirs, potentially. That's legally the basis, simplistically, of how the will goes. All right, I owe this amount of money. I've got this much in assets. I sell the assets to pay that off. There's a hundred grand left. I divide that hundred grand amongst my heirs or the people I name in the will, and that's how it goes. It will go through probate to prove or conform or confirm, rather, the validity of it. And what happens is when a person dies, their attorney will put an ad in the paper. And I'm sure you've seen these ads before that says, if anybody has the interest to a property located at 12 Smith Street, please contact the attorneys, Dewey, Cheatham, and Howe. <laughs> All right. And then what happens is somebody calls those attorneys and go, yes, Raymond owes me money. Here's the bill that I... I loaned him a, a grand and he signed an IOU. So I have a legal claim. That's one of the bills that gets paid off. Now, when they do that, they are trying to determine all of the bills and the assets from whom they owe money to. Where they do this is they must probate in the county where the deceased person lived. Now, I don't know if it's in your notes there, but I want you to add this if it's not, because they also must probate in a county that that person owned real property in. So they may have multiple counties, especially someone that's maybe well-to-do that maybe has rental properties. I live in Brown County, Indiana but I've got property in Johnson County, in Hancock County, in Marion County. So I would have to have my attorney, well, I would because I'd be dead, but the attorney would write that exact statement in all of those counties to give those people notice that Raymond has de deceased. And if you have a claim, you need to step forward, all right? So basically, that is how it is done. The debts are then satisfied based on the amount of assets that are sold. And sometimes what happens is some assets don't have to get sold. You know, you may owe, owe a little and have a lot of assets where you're like, okay, so he had a hundred grand in the bank. He can pay off his two debts. Therefore, now all the houses are free and clear. They would be then distributed amongst all of the heirs. Remember, if you are listing property as part of a probate or an estate, you have to make sure that it goes through all the court systems. And this happens all the time where people come to you and go, hey, my father passed away last week and now I'm, I'm the heir and I want to sell his house. It is not going to be that simple because that father has to go through pro probate and they would name an executor to oversee that probate, to make sure that, that uh, all the bills get paid and all that. This person may not be the executor. We had this several years ago where we sold a property and we jumped through all the hoops and the, uh, the executor of the property actually presented all of the paperwork to the title company. 
and the title company's attorney okayed the sale. So we sold the property. The executor signed off and sold it. And about two weeks later, I got a call from out of state where one of the heirs was just madder than a hornet at me because I sold their property. And I'm like, no, no, we didn't. Your executor sold the property and they had the legal right to do that. And that person claimed, well, they didn't give me my portion of the money. Well, sir, you're now above my pay grade because that has to do with the distribution of assets that was named in the will, not the real estate. All we did was sell the property, which the executor had the right to do. We had nothing to do with that. I would suggest you call your attorney and proceed from that angle. All right. All right. So this is the transfer of property and uh, title work. This next chapter, we're going to deal a little bit more with title work. Once again, there are questions at the end of the online that you should practice. There are questions in the ebook that you should look at and make sure you understand. And if you don't, feel free to reach out to me. My email is Raymond at realuniversity.com and we can discuss anything you want to talk about. See you next chapter.